two classes. Okay, if you remember when we talked about uh, the Bond Williams classification, we said that, that the class 4 and the elements are the drugs that will uh, block the calcium injury channels, particularly the m type calcium channels, um, on the cardiac electrical conduction system or myocytes or whatever you want to call it. Now, um, we we have discussed before that there are two major types of the calcium channel blocker, and these are the non-dihydroperidines and the dihydroperidine. And I mentioned in the previous lectures that the dihydroperidines are the ones used in hypertension. Okay. Mean mean the second level, second level. The food we take. بتفوت عن طريق السايد دورز. Okay, and the non-dihydroperidines uh, and these are terafimal and deltaism are the ones that have major cardio inhibitory effects. Okay, and we said previously that the major two effects are the negative inotropy and thromotropy. Now, um, you would ask how does it produce this negative thromotropy and um, the box say that the major effect of the calcium channel blockers, the non-dihydroperidines, are on the SA and AB node. Let's forget about the SA node because it has many other factors that control its function, but let's look at the AB node. And um, calcium channel blockers produce a major inhibitory effect or block it on the AB node. Now, why is that? If you remember that when we talked about the action potential of the AV node, we said that the calcium entry is the major factor for the excitation phase zero depolarization. Okay? Now, what's the major characteristic or feature of AV node? What's the major function? Yeah. Exactly. So, if you block the calcium entry, you block depolarization and excitation of the AV node, that will increase the delay time. And by the way, I said the last time that the delay time is 0.1 milliseconds. It's seconds. So I'm sorry for that. Now, if let's look at the ECG strip, and that's the important thing. What would be the change on the ECG strip after you administer the non dihydroperidine calcium channel block? Let's start here. And we said that the P wave represents what? Initial contraction in major uh, concepts, and the QRS is the start of the ventricular contraction. So, what lies in between, between the end of the atrial contraction and the start of the ventricular contraction, is the delay that's produced by the AV node. So, if you block the AV node function, if you block the AV node function or conduction, that will increase the delay, and that will lead to what? That will lead to increase in something called the PR interval. Do you understand? Okay. So, if we want to um, summarize the function of the calcium channel blockers, there is first the delayed conduction through the AV node, and there is another thing which is the decreased contractility of the heart. Both of these functions are helpful fighting against dysarrhythmias. Okay? And um, that will be reflected on the ECG strip as a prolongation of the PR interval. Okay, this is class 4. Now, if we want to get to class 5, which is important here because I'm going to discuss in detail one particular drug in this class. Now, class 5, we said, are the miscellaneous drugs, which means these are drugs that target things in the heart, but nobody exactly knows what they target in the heart. Or let me put it in, in another um, uh, way. These are um, drugs that target certain processes within the heart, and the effect of these processes will be to fight against arrhythmias. Okay? Because as we said previously, the uh, four classes, the four previous classes, are the ones that target the ion channels in the heart. But the class five do not target ion channels, but target other things. Now. Um, these, the, the two important drugs that we will discuss here, you will find that the major function, or people think, that the major function is a, a direct AV nodal blockage. 
So in a way, it's similar to both the class 2, which is the beta blocker, and the class 4, the calcium channel blockers. The major effect. Now, the two drugs we, were, we will mention are digoxin, which is a drug we discussed before, and adenosine, which is the new drug. Now, regarding digoxin, now, if you remember when we discussed digoxin in the heart failure lecture, we said that it has um, an important vagal stimu stimulatory effect coupled with a sympathetic downregulatory effect. Now, if you couple these things together, and we said that both the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems control both the heart rate and the contractility and the conduction of the heart, right? So if you do such changes within the autonomic nervous system uh, function on the heart, that will result in certain effects um, against this arrhythmia. Now, the one particular uh, um, use for digoxin in the field of arrhythmias, and I mentioned that previously, and I will mention it again because it's something that you would be asked in multiple choice questions. It's particularly useful in atrial fibrillation in heart failure patients. And can you imagine why? It's easy, because it targets both. It targets the heart failure component of the disease and the atrial fibrillation component of the disease. Okay? Now, that's the joxin. The second drug that I will mention is adenosine. Now, I usually don't believe in drugs or pharmacology or stuff like that until I saw adenosine, and I saw the function of adenosine um, uh, in real life, in real patients. Okay? So what's adenosine? Adenosine is a drug, and let's forget about the exact molecular mechanisms of the function, that produces a transient block in the AB nodal conduction. Okay? Something that um, that's called in, in physiology a transient asystole, okay? Because it produces such a transient block in the conduction. Now, together with that, it has a significant vasodilatory effect, particularly on the systemic arteries, okay? Now, why is that helpful or useful in, in clinical practice against arrhythmia? Now, um, <coughs> Adenosine has a major pharmacological characteristic, which is a very short half-life, and it's estimated to be less than 15 seconds, maybe 10 seconds or something like that. Okay? And it could, because of that, it, it could only be used as an IV injection um, uh, drug. Now, there is one interesting thing about the injection of um, uh, adenosine in, in practice, and if, if, you, if you go to the ER, you will see uh, uh, this practice. You see, this is the um, this is the cannula, and you can see it has this double orifice or triple orifice. This is exactly needed for the administration of adenosine, because as you can see here, um, we prepare the IV injection of adenosine, the syringe, and at the same time we prepare a, a normal saline flush. Okay, and we put it in the other orifice. Now, once you inject this adenosine, fast injection usually, you start uh, flushing with the normal saline. Do you know why, or can you guess why? Increase the half-life. Increase the half-life? No, you cannot increase the half-life. But it's related to half -life. We said it's 15 seconds, or less than 15 seconds. So you might risk, if you do not use the normal saline flush, you might risk that this drug will not get into the heart, right? If I inject it here or there, this 15 seconds time will not be enough to reach the heart. So what we use is a quick normal saline flush to get most of the drug into the heart as quickly as possible and to produce its effect, okay? And um, these when you want to use it, you have to prepare both of these um, um, uh, injections prior to, to, to use, okay? Now, the major um, clinical use of adenosine, as you will see in, in 
practice, and as you will see in books, is acute supraventricular tachycardia. I don't know if he discussed supraventricular tachycardia and what it is, but from its name, it's a tachycardia, and it arises somewhere above the ventricle. Okay? Now, adenosine is particularly useful in there, and wherever you see multiple choice questions and you see acute supraventricular tachycardia, the first term to think about is adenosine. Okay? Now, I will show you um, a practical example of how adenosine functions and how magnificent uh, it works. This is an ECG showing the um, uh, acute supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, it's not important to recognize things, but you will recognize that once we administer adenosine, this thing happen. This is within the span of a few seconds. And as you can see here, the heart rate just dropped so quickly in the patient. And that's why I started believing in drugs. Because whenever I use it in patients and you look on the monitor, things are so wonderful. It's about 200 heart rate and all of a sudden it, it drops to maybe 140 or uh, less than that. But please notice something here, which is this line. Now this is what I said, or what I call ACE stall, or the transient AV model. Okay, you see that the conduction stopped for a while, and that's the major function of adenosine, and this is how it achieves its, its anti-arrhythmic function. Okay? Now, imagine uh, this thing. The heart rate was 200 and it dropped so suddenly and so quickly into 140 or 130 or something like that. Can you imagine what the patient will feel like? People describe it as um, or a typical clinical picture of myocardial infarction. You will see the patient, he is or she is gasping for air and feeling there is something uh, is flying out of their chest. Okay? That's because of the sudden drop in the heart rate. And that's why whenever you want to use adenosine, first off, you have to um, connect the patient into the monitor to look at the changes. And you have to use, don't, don't try it, it's, it's just uh, an interesting thing. And you have to use an oxygen mask or something like that to help the patient. And try to explain the effects to the patient before you use it. Okay, this is important. Important communication skills, you have to explain that thing. Because he might freak out. Okay, and this will make the problem worse. Alright? That's because of the so quick um, uh, effect of adenosine. But it's important that you will guess the side effects. What could be side effects of adenosine? <laughs> I mean, bradycardia, we, we will not get to that point. As I said, usually SVTs or supraventricular tachycardia are about 200 or 180, something like that, and it will drop to, let's say, 100. And it's not recommended to use adenosine for a heart rate of less than 140. Okay? So bradycardia is not that common. But another thing, I said it has a significant effect on the systemic vessels, and that's vasodilation. And one of the major side effects of adenosine is um, hypertension coupled with flushing because of this systemic vasodilation. Now another thing, which is what I described a minute ago, it's the angina pectoris like uh, chest pain, chest tightness, gasping for air. But all of these are something to predict and to take care of before using the drug. A good doctor will predict what's going to happen and will take care of that before it happens. Someone who doesn't know might kill this patient. Okay? So that's the antiarrhythmic um, um, drugs. If you have any further questions, please come to my office. And by the way, something about the etiquette of asking questions. Uh, when someone sends me an email, for, for God's sake, do not send 10 questions. 
If you have 10 questions, then stop by my office. Okay? <coughs> All right. So, do you have any questions before we get into the second lecture? No, I forgot something, which is this. You remember Khalil? Khalil is our patient from the previous lecture. And um, what Khalil had actually was paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. I hope you know some of these terms, but it's not, it's not important. But this was his diagnosis. Okay? You remember he complained of what? Syncope. He just fainted two minutes. all of a sudden without any past medical history or without anything for just a few seconds or minutes. And then he just woke up. And we admitted him to the hospital and we ran um, the continuous cardiac monitoring and we found that he has atrial fibrillation, but there's something called paroxysmal, which means it does not continue all the time, it comes in paroxysm. Okay? And because it's the first time you have to run through all the investigations for the secondary reasons for atrial fibrillation. But the treatment of choice for these patients are divided into two parts. The first is a rhythm control drug, and as I said before, the major drug in this class is amiodarone. That's why I explained it in detail the last time. And the second thing is a rate control drug, and which class of drugs we said are rate controllers? What? Beta blocker. What? Beta Class what? Beta class two. One. One. Rate. Any class rate. one we said are rate controllers. Rate That's control. great. Class one. You haven't studied. Class two. Class two. Class two. Class two. Class two, which are the beta blockers. Class two. Okay. Beta These blocker. are the rate controllers, and one of the major drugs used in this category is beta blocker. And there's another thing in clinical practice because this disease is associated with a very high risk for um, um, stroke, uh, these patients are usually um, um, put on an anticoagulant drug like water. Okay, we're done. Any questions before we get to the second lecture? Perfect. Okay, so now we have two lectures about the antihypertensive uh, drug therapy. Now, as you, as you remember, a couple of months ago, we discussed these things in detail, all right? And I mentioned to you that please study these drugs before you come into this lecture, because I'm not going to go through the details of last time. What I'm going to do today is try to add to what we discussed before, add it in an interesting way, because I'm going to couple it to clinical practice, okay? So whenever I pass through things, Quickly, that means that it's in the previous lecture and you can refer to that lecture. Deal? Okay. Now, I'm not going to go through the definitions of hypertension and all these things. But I will say one thing. Having done or studied all these types of drugs or classes of antihypertensive drugs, all of you, I'm sure, are thinking, is it even worth it? Is it even studying all these drugs and, and taking care of them? And the answer to that, in my opinion, comes from a report by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in 2000 in the United States. And they looked at the mortality rates of two of the major killers worldwide. The cerebrovascular accidents, meaning strokes, and heart failure, congestive heart failure, the cardiovascular accidents. Now, as you can see, there is a huge decline starting from the late 70s. And among the few reasons for this decline, as the, uh, the reporters claimed, was the advent of new classes and improved drugs, antihypertensive drugs, and the introduction of improved guidelines for the use of hypertensive drugs. So you can see that it's worth it, money-wise, effort-wise, and whatever you want to have to spend time on studying and um, uh, uh, discussing the antihypertensive drugs because you can prevent or you can reduce the mortality rates associated with major killers <coughs> worldwide. Okay? Now, treatment of essential hypertension as we discussed before. Our target blood pressure is uh, or with treatment 
should be a systolic blood pressure of less than 140 and a diastolic of less than 9. Okay? So get your patient from stage 1 into at least pre-hypertension stage. Okay? Now, unless your patient has other comorbidities, particularly diabetes mellitus, then your target should go further down. And that's when you see that the systolic blood pressure should be 130 and the diastolic should be 80. And of course, this is a pain in the ass. It does not happen in 90% of the time, but these are the guidelines. Okay? Now, let's see the pharmacological strategies. I omitted the part about the lifestyle modification, although I'm sure I discussed in detail why it's important to, to start with the lifestyle modification. So go back to the lecture. But I will focus today on the drugs part. Now, to make it easy, as I said before, go back to the equation. The equation will make your life easier and you will understand everything much better. And the basic equation we discussed is that blood pressure equals cardiac output multiplied by the peripheral vascular resistance plus the central venous pressure. Now, if I want to reduce this, then what could be the strategies to do that? Reduce First, the cardiac output. Decrease cardiac output. Second, decrease the peripheral vascular resistance. Peripheral vascular resistance. Third, decrease the central venous pressure. Good? Okay. Now let's go a little bit more. If I want to reduce cardiac output, I said that there are three or four major factors regulating cardiac output. Anyone remembers? One, heart, heart, rate. heart rate. Two, stroke volume. Contraction. Stroke volume or blood volume. Contractility. Three, contraction. Contractility. Four, is preload. Is related to blood volume. Four, conduction. Conduction. The dromotropic effect. Right. So that's easy. Once you lay things into classes and lists, it's much easier. So if I want to reduce cardiac output, I should reduce heart rate, contractility, and conduction velocity. What could be the major classes that could achieve these functions? Beta blockers. Beta blockers, yes. Calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers. Right? Good. So these are the major two classes that will achieve this function. And the third one is to decrease the stroke volume or the blood volume in general. Diuretics. And what's the major drug that will achieve that? Diuretics. Diuretics. Okay. Now, the second part would be to reduce the peripheral vascular resistance. How would you do that? Alpha-1 blockers, vasodilators. Exactly. Either you increase the vasodilators in the body or you decrease the vasoconstrictors in the body. Now, if you want to use vasodilators, what could be the major drugs in this class? First, what's the major component or regulator of smooth muscle contraction in the body? Calcium. Calcium. So what should I use? Calcium. 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 Second, what's the second most important thing for the contraction of vessels? Or the alpha one. Alpha, alpha, one. alpha one. Alpha one receptors. Exactly. The alpha one receptors on the blood vessel. These regulate the sympathetic tone. What else could we use? Beta. Two agonists. Beta, Beta two agonists. Um, we said that it's very debatable. The effect of um, beta 2 on the uh, blood vessels is minor. And that's why when I showed you the sympathetic tone of the vessel, I said it's majorly controlled by the alpha. alpha one. But I mentioned another class of drugs that will control the vasodilation. The last would be the direct, direct vasodilators. Right? Mm -hmm. we, will, we will pass through these things, so you will freshen up your memory. And the second thing is to reduce vasoconstriction, right? And what's the major controller of vasoconstriction in the body? Alpha 1. Maybe alpha 1, so I might use alpha. 1 blocker. Agonist. Okay. Okay. Or sorry, antagonist. Or antagonist, use. any blocker. But what's the other thing? Ras. Are you even here? I said study the lecture before you come here. Okay. So it's the brass inhibitor, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system inhibitor. Okay? Now, we said that there are two um, strategies to use the antihypertensive drugs in patients. 
The first one is the monotherapy, and the second one is the combination therapy. Now, I said before that almost two-thirds, according to the 2013 um, uh, surveys, that two-thirds of the patients, and even more than that, it's about 70% of patients, will need combination therapy at one stage. And this is particularly for essential hypertension. Okay? Now, the monotherapy, is it helpful or useful? Of course it's useful. And particularly in the stage one hypertension. You. Define stage one hypertension. Shall, uh, Stage 1 hypertension. Blood pressure, systolic, 140. Stage 1 hypertension. Lady. You. Doctor. classification is deep and why we got into a new classification. I'm taking the whole group of the Awesome. Okay. Go back and study the stages of hypertension. You're going to be great done. For stage one hypertension, the current guidelines and recommendations. And I'm going to ask these questions in the exam. Okay? I'm not going to ask easy and straightforward questions. If it's a stage one hypertension, then the major guidelines are use lifestyle modification and start with a monotherapy for hypertension. Okay? Once you get to a stage 2 hypertension, then the recommendations are to use the combination therapy, which is double or triple antihypertensive therapy. Okay. Now, we will start with the first and major class of antihypertensive drugs, and it's the diuretics. Okay? Now, diuretics can be divided Again, I'm not going to go through the basic principles you can refer in the previous lecture. The diuretic or diuretics can be divided into two major classes. And the first one are drugs that will target this kind of transporter on the distal convoluting tubule. And as you can see, this transporter <coughs> um, gets the sodium and chloride back into the body. So it's a reabsorption of sodium and chloride. So we have a class of diuretics that will target this transporter, and these are the thiazide diuretics. Mm -hmm. What's the percentage of reabsorption that's achieved here? Five percent. Five percent. And that's why when we say that thiazide diuretics achieve a function of reduction in excretion of sodium and water, it's about only five percent. Good? Now, the, the, um, the two major um, um, examples of these thiazide diuretics are the hydrochlorothiazide and the chlorotalidone. Now, um, I'm not going to ask you about details of each drug, but just for your interest, <coughs> currently the most commonly used thiazide diuretic is hydrochlorothiazide because it's extremely cheap. Now, chlorotalidone, the recent studies say that there is no difference in efficacy or potency between the two drugs. Okay. The only difference is that the chlorotelidone has a very long uh, uh, duration of action. Okay? So it might be used when uh, the compliance of the patient is less. Okay. Now the second class of diuretics would be uh, drugs that will target this co-transporter of sodium, 2-chloride, and potassium on the thick ascending limb of the loop of him. And these are the loop diuretic. And what's the percentage of reduction in sodium water? 25, 25 or reabsorption? It's almost 25%. So efficacy-wise, you can see that these drugs are more effective. Okay? But is this good or bad? Bad. Why? Patient will lifestyle not be. Okay. You see the Now. That the uh, two major um, drugs used in this category are the bumetanide and furosemide. And I will focus on furosemide because you will remember me when you get into the internal medicine uh, um, lectures. 
It's the most commonly used drug currently in practice, particularly in the ER settings, and it could be used as in injectable or in oral tabs form. Okay? Now, how do diuretics achieve their function? How do they reduce the blood pressure? What's the major function? Increase the secretion of sodium. It's natriuresis and diuresis. And diuresis. So it's the sodium and water, it's excretion. Okay? Now, so what? What if you reduce these things? What's going to happen? Blood volume will decrease. Blood volume will be reduced. Central venous pressure will be reduced. Go back to the equation we discussed before. Blood pressure will be reduced. That's the major effect. But as I told you before, there is a chronic effect that once you reduce the blood volume and central venous pressure, the other thing that will be affected is cardiac output, and that's because blood volume represents the preload of the heart, right? So if you reduce both of these things, that's going to come back to reduce the blood pressure. So there's an, a cumulative effect, both in the acute and the chronic use, on both limbs of the equation. It's the central venous pressure and the cardiac output. Great. Now, some practical comments. First off, as I said, these are great drugs and every doctor should know about them. And that's because they are generally cheap, effective, and safe. Okay? Because of this, they are considered an integral part to combination therapy for the treatment of hypertension. This is the major reason why it's important to use diuretics in your combination therapy. But that's not the only reason. The other reason is this. Now, the clinical effect of diuretics depends on two major factors. This is a new concept, so focus please. The clinical effect of diuretics depends on two major factors. The first one, and this is something you should expect, it's the extent of the counter-regulatory mechanisms in the body. Now, we said that the clinic or the, the basic effect of diuretics is to reduce the CDP, the cardiac output, and the blood volume. But will that happen without any response from the body? The virus. Exactly. So we have something of a fight back mechanism. Go back to what we discussed on the start of hypertension and heart failure. We have the baroreceptor reflex, and this will lead to activation of both what the sympathetic, sympathetic. system and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So in a way or another, you can see that at one point we will get to a balance of effects. <coughs> Diuretics produce one thing, which is reduction in all of these factors. On the other hand, the sympathetic activation and dress activities increase, so there will be some sort of balance. So what could you do as a physician to change that? Exactly. Exactly. So the next approach, clinical approach, when you use diuretics, at one point you will need to combine the diuretic use with either a sympathetic, uh, sympathetic blocker or a RAS inhibitor. inhibitor. Whatever, is it a, whether it's a renin inhibitor, a doser inhibitor, or angiotensin to uh, function inhibitor. Okay? And that's why, as, as I said, diuretics are important for the combination therapy. Because it's generally safe, cheap, and ex inexpensive. And there is a logical thinking that says it should be used in combination with other drugs because of the chronic effects and the activation of these counter-regulatory mechanisms. Are you following? Okay. Now the second thing, as you remember, we said that there is a reduction in the blood volume and there is an increase in the excretion of sodium and water. But that will depend on one thing, and it's what? It's how much blood you get into the kidney. The diuretics will achieve their function of increasing the excretion. Right? So imagine um, it's the faucet, the Hanafian, However, water you give it, it can give you, right? So the major thing that affects the, um, uh, the function of diuretics is the renal blood flow, the glomerular filtration rate. If you increase this, 
then the excretion, the amount to be excreted, sodium and water, will be what? Increased. Right? Good. So the renal blood flow is important. And that's why we need to discuss this thing. I haven't mentioned previously to make things simple. Loop diuretics increase the prostaglandin synthesis. So what? Is that even related to this? What's the major function of prostaglandin? It's vasodilation, right? If you do the systemic vasodilation or at least the local vasodilation within the vicinity of the nephron, what's going to happen to the renal blood flow? Increase. So what's going to be what's going to happen to the volume of the blood that could be cleared uh, by diuretics? Increase. And that's why when you increase the renal blood flow, the function of diuretics would be higher. And that's another thing why loop diuretics are more effective than thiazide diuretics. Mm -hmm. Loop diuretics, they have this effect on a 25% reduction of the sodium and water reabsorption. And the second thing is that they the have a major function of increasing the prostaglandin's synthesis. Okay, what could be another clinical valuable uh, point here? What's the major class of drugs that inhibit, in, inhibit the prostaglandin synthesis? Toxin. Exactly, the NSAIDs. NSAIDs are like um, it's over the counter drugs in Jordan, and it's almost like water. People just like to have the non steroids. And one, it's important to understand this for you as a clinician, you will have a lot of patients who will have poor control of their blood pressure. And you're maximizing doses of drugs, and you're maximizing the combination of drugs. But it could be back to a very simple point that. Um, there is a drug-drug interaction. Non-steroids inhibit the prostaglandin synthesis, and particularly on the chronic use of diuretics, this is important because it will render the function of diuretics and it will reduce the effect of these diuretics. Okay? Good. Now, thiazide diuretics are first-line antihypertensive. As I said, they are very cheap, and they're great. They achieve their function. And particularly in the elderly group and in the diabetics group. So almost always, when you have an elderly patient or a diabetic patient, you will think of starting these patients on thiazide diuretics. Remember this, diabetics, thiazide, diuretics. Good? Now, loop diuretics, on the other hand, are not a first-line drug. They're not used every day, okay? They are reserved for patients who have fluid overload states. Give me one fluid overload state in the body. Edema. I know, edema. Heart failure. Give me a disease that produces edema. Heart failure. Heart failure. One. And renal failure. Renal, failure. renal, renal failure. disease. Listen, this is for you. When you see generalized edema in the body. Think about heart, yeah. kidney, liver, thyroid gland. Okay? I was, I was asked this question in, in my sixth year final exam. So always think about heart, lung, uh, liver, kidney, and thyroid gland. Okay? So, in these cases, we use the loop diuretics because their function is, is um, um, great because they will reduce the reabsorption of water and sodium by 25%. So there is a major reduction in the fluid volume within the body. Okay? Now, what could be the side effects of these drugs? First off, any antihypertensive anti anti drug, the first side effect is hypertension. Hypertension. Now, because we discussed the function of these drugs, and as I said, they are related to the uh, potassium excretion or secretion in the body, one of the major side effects is hypokalemia. <laughs> now, hypokalemia is easy to understand for the loop diuretics, okay, because it's in the co transporter system, but how it's produced by the thiazide diuretics, it's something I discussed before, so please refer to your lecture. And finally, there is an, another side effect, which is hyperuricemia. Why is it happening? Decreasing blood volume, so... 
Exactly. So, so there is some sort of volume contraction or reduction in the blood volume. So the concentration of solutes will be increased. So there will be hyperuricemia. There is another reason, but I'm not going to explain. But that's the major uh, thing. Now, two things I have to add here. Two particular side effects for each subclass. Now, Thysite diabetics, it was noticed that one, I won't say common, but one side effect to expect in patients, and it's hyperglycemia. Okay. How is it happening? Nobody knows exactly, but people say that thiazide diuretics decrease the secretion of insulin and also decrease the uptake of glucose by the cells. Good? Okay. No. It's not something very little. But is that okay for you? I'm saying that thiazide diuretics have uh, a predictable yeah, side effect, okay. which is hyperglycemia. <laughs> Thank you. There is someone who was awake. I said it's a first line in hypertensive, particularly in <laughs> diabetic patients. But there is a predictable side effect, which is hyperglycemia. This does not go with this, and if it goes, this is wrong. Now, the recent studies say that this effect, particularly of thiazides, is dose dependent. Okay? Which means what? If you use very high doses of thiazide diuretics, it will lead to hyperglycemia. Okay, good. But the other part of the study said that there is no difference between the high dose and the low dose effects of thiazide. So the potency and efficacy wise, there's no difference between the high dose or low dose. They will achieve the same uh, benefits. Okay? And that's why most of most phys physicians never go up on the uh, um, thiazide diuretics dose. They give you this low or moderate dose and that's it. If it doesn't work, they change into another class. Good? Okay. Now the other thing, the loop diuretics have another side effect which is predictable also, but nobody exactly knows why it happens. They, they are autotoxic. They produce some major defects in the hearing process. Okay. Now is that important clinically again? Of course it's important. Because I'm mentioning it. But why? Why is it important? Please. Exactly. So try, or it's not try, do not mix two autotoxic drugs at the same time. Okay? One particular autotoxic drug, as you, your colleague said, are. What? Exactly. Antibiotics. So. Do not mix these two drugs at the same time because it's, it might increase the risk for this autotoxic effect. By the way, for both of these drugs, nobody understands why it leads to this effect. But So try to avoid it. Okay. Now, because hypokalemia and these metabolic changes, particularly the hypokalemia, is a major side effect for the diuretics use, there is another class of diuretics that will target another transporter system within the nephron, um, uh, particularly this uh, um, uh, receptor that's no regulated by aldosterone function. Okay, and these are the potassium sparing diuretics, and they achieve a very minimal reduction in the sodium and water uh, um, um, reabsorption. It's about one to two percent. But notice here that this transporter will prevent the occurrence of hypokalemia. So whenever hypokalemia is a problem for you, refer to potassium sparing agents. But the question is, could you use them as monotherapy? No. You cannot use them as monotherapy because the effect is very minimal. What you could do is just to combine two diuretics at the same time, a potassium sparing diuretic plus a loop or 
a thiazide directed, and that just that's just to prevent the occurrence of hypokalemia. So what could be a side effect of these drugs? Hyperkalemia. Okay. Uh, again, if you do not remember or memorize the name of the drugs, please. Yes, I will leave it there. But that's true. Metabolic acidosis could be a, a, a side effect. Any questions before we get to the second class? Please. Who said that every renal failure patient is on dialysis? Again, it does not make sense, but nobody knows why. But there's an observed effect. True. Okay, so we will discuss one part of this class, and I will give you a break, and then we will come back for smokers to go out. Okay, so as, I, as you remember, the adrenergic blockers are divided into three limbs, and these are the alpha blockers, and the major function would be on them, blood vessels. The beta blockers, particularly the cardio-selective ones, the major function would be on the heart. And we have another class. Okay, I, I told you, I'm, I'm going to give you a break. So keep silent for two minutes. And the third class is the central sympatholytic drugs that will target both functions, or a global reduction in the sympathetic activity. Now, I'm going to discuss only the alpha adrenergic block. Now, as you just mentioned before, alpha, block, alpha 1 receptors are the major regulators of the sympathetic tone, okay, and the blood vessel. So, as you can see here, if I block the alpha 1 receptor on the vascular smooth muscle cell, then the major effect would be vasodilation. Vasodilation. Right? Yes. Because I'm inhibiting the tone, so on. Uh, um, relaxing the small muscle and producing the vasodilation. So what? What's going to happen if you do vasodilate? Decrease the The peripheral vascular resistance would be reduced. And again, back to the equation, if you reduce this, then the blood pressure would be reduced. Uh, now, the most commonly used drug in this class is the prasocin. And as you can see, if you remember that I highlighted the same part here because it's um, um, synonymous with the alpha blockers. Now, Prezisen, the, the problem with it is that the effect will not be that great. Okay, so it's reserved for the mild to moderate hypertension or hypertension associated with certain cases. Like in males with benign prostatic hyperplasia, Right? You know, one of the major drugs against that is the alpha blockers, or are the alpha blockers. So it's great when you have at least two diseases that could be targeted by one drug. Okay? Like what we said about digoxin, it targets heart failure, it targets atrial fibrillation. So if you have a patient who has both, it's the first line drug. Okay? This is called the clinical sense. Now, it's seldom used alone. And particularly because it's always, almost always, combined with beta blockers. Anyone predicts why? Please. Exactly. Again, as we said, if you block something, the body will not leave it there. There will be counter-regulatory mechanisms. And in this case, you're inhibiting peripheral vascular resistance. The response will be on the heart to stimulate things. And that's why tachycardia mostly. And that's why we use it with a cardioselective beta-1 blocker. So the major side effects of alpha blockers would be what? Tachycardia. Hypertension and tachycardia, tachycardia, if we use it alone. But there is one thing particular about their um, uh, uh, hypertension. As I said, the orthostatic changes in blood pressure are regulated mainly by what? By the sympathetic tone. Okay? And the sympathetic tone is regulated by the alpha receptors, so if you block that, you're going to 
increase the difference between standing and supine measurements of blood pressure, and that's why there is orthostatic hypertension. And uh, for your knowledge, anyone who's first prescribed alpha blockers, they are encouraged to take it on a, at mid time. Okay? Um, so a lot of patients would come to you and say, I have a drug and it's against um, uh, hypertension. Um, they do not know the name. But if they mention that it's taken at big time, then there's a high uh, probability that it's an Take a break. Five minutes and come back. Um,